Bear in mind that that Klansmen, when they were, as they normally did, terrorizing isolated black or white farmsteads and cabins and in disguise, attacking, killing uh, defenseless men, women, and yes, children. They, they, they thought themselves very brave and heroic, but when they were faced with the, the carbines of the Seventh Cavalry, they, they caved. They were cowards. They were cowards. Their way of fighting was inherently cowardly because their targets were civilians, but they couldn't face soldiers at all. So they collapsed between being penetrated from the inside and confronted with soldiers ready to fight them. The claim collapsed and they surrendered in, in, in great numbers in South Carolina. I'm Anna Hickey, Associate Editor of Communications for Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 28th, 2023. Between 1865 and 1872, the first iteration of the Ku Klux Klan conducted a reign of terror across the former Confederate states, harassing, intimidating, and murdering freed people and their white allies. As violence spread with impunity across the South, Congress, a President Ulysses S. Grant's urging, passed three enforcement acts which radically expanded the federal government's ability to protect individuals from violence when their state governments could or would not. I sat down with Fergus Bordewick, author of Klan War, Ulysses S. Grant and the Battle to Save Reconstruction, to discuss how the Grant administration fought the first domestic terrorist organization the federal government had ever faced. We also talked about the political terrorism conducted by the Klan in that era and what we can learn from that violent period of American history. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 28th, America's First War on Terror with Fergus Bordewick. So, Fergus, what got you interested in researching the federal government's fight against the Klan? I had several motivations. One, this story folded out naturally from my previous book, which was a book about uh, how Congress fought the Civil War. Congress at War was the book's title. And I focused in that book on congressional Republican radicals, who also were the cutting edge of Reconstruction policy, men like Thaddeus Stevens, Ben Wade, and others. So I was already thinking a lot about Reconstruction when I was writing the previous book. And why the radicals? Because they were the most forward-looking members of the Republican Party, which was the dominant party, of course, at that time. And I became also sharply aware of the extreme violence of the Klan during that period. There were three iterations of the Klan in American history. This book is about the first iteration, the Klan of the 1860s and 70s, the original Ku Klux Klan, which was the first organized terrorist movement in American history, which became manifest very clearly the more I dug into it that it was not only violently terrorist, but also that it was pretty well organized. And that set me to thinking about terrorism in the present day. We think of terrorism as something that happens in, generally speaking, in in foreign countries perpetrated by organizations with odd names like Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Hamas, Uh, whereas uh, the terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan was homegrown, purely American, and as violent and often barbaric as any foreign terrorist organization. And I I became very interested in seeing how Americans had dealt with homegrown terrorism that completely destabilized nearly all the former Confederate states. And we'll say one other thing, which is that as a young person, when I was in college many years ago, I I did... uh, voter registration work, civil rights work in the South and back in the 1960s and had a couple of personal confrontations with the Klan of that era, of the 1960s. And I saw the Klan up close. It was as as violent and menacing as it was in the 1960s. It was far, far more so in the 1860s. But so there's a personal dimension to this for me as well. That's remarkable. During your research of this book, did anything surprise you? Like when I was reading it, I knew that the Klan was extremely brutal, but the level of brutality and impunity that was existed in the post-Confederate states shocked me. 
additionally, the you wrote about in the book, Congress sent committees to go travel throughout the South and hear testimony. And I mean, the bravery of the people going to give testimony, that also, I think, shocked me as well. During your research, did anything particularly stand out to you as something that you either didn't know going into it or the level of it you were, you know, unaware of? Well, you've pretty much put your finger on it. I will say here that one of the main resources I used was the report of the Joint Committee, Congressional Joint Committee on the Ku Klux Klan, which, as you said, dispatched subcommittees to travel through nearly all the former Confederate states, collecting testimony on the uh, activities of the Ku Klux Klan. Those committees interviewed hundreds, many hundreds of um, victims of Klan violence, a great many of them African-American. This was the first instance in American history of of African-Americans testifying to federal committees. Incidentally, it was also the first instance of women uh, testifying to uh, federal committees. So it's quite historic. The committee as a whole produced 13 volumes of testimony, approximately 6,000 pages. So in this material, in in this report, uh, or it's many reports really on each state, you are hearing essentially in real time the voices of people who have suffered clan violence, who have themselves been beaten, shot, uh, whose family members have been killed, raped, parents, children, spouses, murdered, often in truly barbaric ways. And I, I will say, to your point, that the ex- sadistic violence of, of much that the Klan perpetrated was truly breathtaking. Now, my book shifts back and forth between events in the South, in the hamlets and towns of, uh, of the former Confederate states, and, and Washington's attempt to craft some kind of policy to deal with the Klan. So I go back and forth. But I, I felt it was imperative not to shy away from the barbarism and there are, I, I, I don't know that I care to describe anything in detail here at the moment. It's in the book. Uh, but there was truly unspeakable, perverse, sexually perverse violence uh, committed against people, both men and women, not just African-Americans, but also white Republicans who uh, dared to stand up against the Klan. Uh, so much the degree of violence was eye-opening in a, in a rather awful way. I mean, it reveals what otherwise seemingly ordinary Americans are capable of when they feel that they have impunity. You also put your finger on that, that for several years, the Klan, uh, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands of members, by the way, by the late 1860s, was able to carry out its, its uh, terrorism with virtual impunity, because for the most part, the Klan either intimidated or co-opted local law enforcement. Where it was not able to do that, they they murdered law enforcement officers, sheriffs, sometimes judges, members of state legislatures who who dared stand against them. Uh, So the systematic quality of Klan violence was greater than I supposed when I I began working on this. And in addition, I think one has to think of the Klan as something like the paramilitary arm of the Southern Democratic Party. It was highly political. This wasn't random violence. It targeted primarily office holders or natural leaders in the black and white Republican communities. Its targets were political. Its aim was, besides trying to terrify former slaves back into servility, uh, its aim was to crush the embryonic two-party system in the South. That is, the frail, uh, struggling Republican Party, which was biracial, very effectively biracial at the beginning, to a degree that I, I don't think Americans entirely appreciate and that within that biracial Republican Party of that time, African-Americans 
were were not just passive tools of so-called northern carpetbaggers and or southern scalawags. These are pejoratives that we shouldn't really have to use anymore. But were the African Americans were often actors, very creative political people in their in their own right, and the degree of African American political sophistication during this period is very, very striking. That that was largely erased from historical memory during the long, long Jim Crow <laughs> veneration of the lost cause era, which lasted almost a century. And then you mentioned that the push of the book is looking at how Congress and the federal government ends up tackling and going to war against the Klan. In the book, you write that the passage of the Third Enforcement Act was as close to a declaration of war as Congress could issue in peacetime. How did Congress and the radical Republican Congress members view the Klan and the federal government's ability to combat the terror that was epidemic in the South at this time? This is really central to my book. It's called, after all, Klan War, which primarily refers to the war against the Klan. I'll talk a little bit about Ulysses Grant. Maybe we'll come back to him again. Grant was committed to trying to destroy the Klan. Uh, Grant was a far more effective president in this sphere than he was has generally been given credit for. Radicals in Congress, Republican radicals in Congress, were eager to, to uh, crack down on the Klan. Uh, to put their dilemma in, in, in context, you have to remember that for several years, immediately after the Civil War, from 65 to early 69, the president was Andrew Johnson, who was not a Republican. He was a, what was then called a war Democrat, but who saw his political future lying in re-empowering Southern Democrats. He had no future in the Republican Party. He wasn't a Republican. So Johnson, uh, as best he could, tried to carry out a policy of premature conciliation with the South, re-empowering uh, former Confederates to re-enter public life, be elected uh, to office, including to Congress. So Congress, a, a Republican Congress, was struggling against Johnson's recalcitrance. Johnson did not approve of the Klan, but he belittled it. That's one problem. The other is a continuing political struggle over states' rights. Americans today, I think, don't do not realize that for most of American history, until really into the 20th century, responsibility for enforcing the Constitution, or or at least the uh, basic rights that we enjoy under the Constitution, freedom of speech and so on, to ensuring the protection of those rights, lay with the states, not the federal government. Those were considered not federal responsibilities. And indeed, there were several Supreme Court decisions in the late Reconstruction era, which undermined the federal government's attempt under Grant and under the congressional radicals' uh, efforts to enforce the Constitution and civil rights protections in the South. So Congress is wrestling, even after Grant becomes president, takes office in March of 1869, even once Grant is in the presidency, there's no consensus that the federal government has the authority to protect citizens in the South against the Klan. It's, broadly speaking, assumed to be a state responsibility. In in states that enforce the law, maybe that would work out all right. But many Southern states, not all, but many were entirely or partially in the hands of former Confederates who had no interest in enforcing protection of African-Americans or, for that matter, white Republicans. And as I said earlier, law enforcement across the former Confederate states had largely, not totally, but largely either been been intimidated or co-opted by the Klan. Uh, So there was a paralysis of policy. Congress finally, in 1870-71, passed three enforcement acts. Uh, It was a struggle, but finally these were passed. Uh, in an attempt to define a federal authority to crack down on the Klan. All three enforcement acts attempted 
to bring to rein in the Klan. The third one was the strongest. It's generally known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. And among other things, it gave the president, Ulysses Grant, the authority to suspend habeas corpus where local governments couldn't enforce the law. In addition, the Ku Klux Klan Act defined practically everything the Klan did from riding around in costumes to house invasion, intimidation, threats, not to mention, not to mention even worse violence, uh, as federal crimes. This was a watershed. It was revolutionary from a legal point of view to treat these as federal crimes. And uh, the Klan Act also gave the president the authority to dispatch troops into counties that were regarded as being in insurrection uh, in order to fight the Klan, which Grant did. So finally, finally, the federal government was empowered to take on the Klan directly rather than feeling compelled to rely on local governments that wouldn't enforce the law. Using the KKK Act and the federal government's newly granted authority, how did President Grant go after the Klan? In your book, you mentioned that South Carolina is one of the main battlegrounds. Like, What actions did the federal government take kind of for the first time to combat domestic terrorism in the former Confederate states and especially South Carolina? Grant's campaign against the Klan was two-pronged. There's the military side and there was the legal side. On the military side, he dispatched about a thousand fresh troops to upcountry South Carolina. He suspended habeas corpus in nine counties, nine the nine counties that were most infested with the Ku Klux Klan. And when I say infested, that's not just a generalization. The uh, membership, Klan membership among white males in those counties ranged from 50 to 80 percent. In other words, nearly all white adult men were members of the Ku Klux Klan, and others were either tacit collaborators or intimidated. Grant set out to make upcountry South Carolina a, a, a demonstration. It was his demonstration case of what the federal government could and would do, and that it was, it was determined to really bring down the Klan because it was one of the worst centers, probably the worst in the former Confederate States. But who were these thousand soldiers? It's quite interesting. They were largely members of the 7th Cavalry. And many people, of course, will uh, realize that the 7th Cavalry was George Custer's regiment, much of which would be wiped out at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. So yes, some of these troopers who are sent to South Carolina to fight the Klan are the same men who are going to die under Custer at the Little Bighorn. Now, Custer did not accompany them to South Carolina. Why would that be? Because Custer himself was a reactionary who did not support Reconstruction. He had no interest, whatever, in protecting African Americans. And he spent this period uh, mostly uh, raising horses in Kentucky. However, in charge of the 7th Cavalry in South Carolina at the time was a terrifically capable and very interesting officer, Major Lewis Merrill, who was a rare abolitionist in the upper ranks of the army. He uh, uh, led federal troops in a guerrilla war against Confederate guerrillas during the Civil War in Missouri. West Point graduate, he was also a lawyer. And happily, he was also an extremely good writer. So his reports uh, in the National Archives, which he sent in regularly, are are not only extremely interesting to read, but they're 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 full of detail and with a sensitivity to the psychology both of formerly enslaved people and to the kinds of people who would join the Klan that makes it possible for for well uh, for myself a writer. Or readers to enter into the minds of, of, of those who were deeply enmeshed in, in the terror war in the South. So uh, the military commander was exceptionally capable and he penetrated the Klan with various types of spies, both white and black. How could there be black spies 
in the Klan because these counties were, roughly speaking, about 50% black. Klansmen tended to be the kind of people who either owned slaves or had former slaves on their property and didn't think they were smart enough or alert enough to be listening to what was going on. So it was informants among African Americans in South Carolina were extremely effective uh, in delivering information. Merrill quickly learned who belonged to the Klan, who was leading it, and what its what its plans were. Uh, so that's, that's the military side. And the similar military activity was taking place in other states. Uh, in my book, I focus on South Carolina because it was really the main test case. Uh, on the legal side, I'm going to step back a second. Grant, Grant has for the first time, an effective justice department to work with. Prior to this, legal uh, federal government's legal services were often ad hoc. Uh, different agencies had their own lawyers. Different, different departments had their own lawyers. And there was no central coordination. In 1871, that was brought together in the newly established justice department, which became, under Grant, a, an effective a very effective arm of the executive for the first time. He also had as, not his first, but his his most important attorney general, a remarkable man named Amos Ackerman, who uh, was a Republican from Georgia. Amos Ackerman, well, I, I won't go too far into his life story, though it's quite interesting. He was originally born in New England, but uh, moved to Georgia as a young man, studied law there, became a lawyer, and was a very, very reluctant Confederate. He was never a soldier as such, but uh, he was only too happy to uh, let go of, of the Confederacy once it, it, it was defeated. Quickly rose in the Republican Party. He was a reformer, and he, he pretty quickly uh, embraced radical Republicanism when I say radical republicanism, what do I really mean here? Because these words have, have shifted. Uh, radicalism in the 1860s and 70s was not leftism, as people generally tend to think of it today, at least as when it applies to uh, the, the liberal side of the political spectrum. Uh, but rather, it refers to those republicans who were committed to a very forceful and transformative, even revolutionary reconstruction policy, rebuilding the former Confederate states on a new economic basis to disestablish the old oligarchy and empower African Americans. And that is the other aspect that's definitive for radicalism of the period, which is a commitment to the civil rights of African Americans. So Amos Ackerman was such a man and he personally took charge of the legal campaign against the Klan and dispatched forceful and effective federal prosecutors. Never enough, must, it must be said, because Congress wouldn't fund the departments efficiently, but federal prosecutors into the South to prosecute the Klan. So between uh, the military side, uh, uh, Major Merrill and his troops, and Amos Ackerman and, and his federal lawyers, approximately 5,000 Klansmen were arrested and indicted in, in upcountry South Carolina. Many more elsewhere in other parts of the South. Uh, the total number probably approached 10,000. But in South Carolina alone, about 5,000. The Klan collapsed. Bear in mind that, that Klansmen, when they were, as they normally did, terrorizing isolated black or white farmsteads and cabins and in disguise attacking, killing uh, defenseless men, women, and yes, children. They, they, they thought themselves very brave and heroic, but when they were faced with the, the carbines of the 7th Cavalry, they, they caved. They were cowards. They were cowards. Their way of fighting was inherently cowardly because their targets were civilians, but they couldn't face soldiers at all. So they collapsed between being penetrated from the inside and confronted with soldiers ready to fight them. The Klan collapsed and they surrendered in, in, in great numbers in South Carolina. So that's, that is the, I mean, that, that's a, a kind of capsule version of, of Grant's policy. And up to this point, it was really quite effective. The Klan was pretty much demolished 
as an organization by 1872, 1873. And then thinking about what happened after 1872 and 1873, the Klan obviously comes back in various iterations throughout the America's history, 1920s, as you mentioned, in the 1960s. Thinking about President Grant's war against the Klan as a whole, how would you view it in terms of relative success of whether or not the goals that they set out to achieve were achieved? And then also how it impacted the government's future wars on terror that then happened after in combating domestic terrorism? The initial goal of, of Grant's war against the Klan was to destroy the Klan as, as, a, as an organized force. That succeeded. That was a triumph. And the country saw it that way. It was reported that way in, in the press. Uh, that part of the press, the Northern press and the Republican press that supported it. Of course, Democrats in the South who were post-Confederates, let's say, whose values weren't very different from those of the Confederacy, always condemned the war against the Klan and belittled the threat of the Klan. Northern Democrats um, tended also to belittle the threat even in the first place and denied its reality. They denied the violence part. At least 2,000 people were murdered by the Klan in the late 1860s, early 1870s. Northern Democrats needed their alliance with Southern Democrats to regain power. So they, they pretended that the dangers of the Klan were not as great as they were. So at any rate, the, the war against the Klan was a success. It was such a success that the Northern public generally lost interest in continuing to sustain Reconstruction in the South. Broadly speaking, Northerners were tired of the South's problems anyway. They were tired of Black Americans' appeals for help. Racism wasn't unique to the South. It also was widespread in the North at the time. And uh, once the insurrectionist quality of the Klan had been eliminated, Northerners, by and large, were ready to turn away. So what happened in Congress was twofold. One, radicals either aged out, died, or were defeated beginning in the early 1870s. So the, the, the cutting edge of Reconstruction policy was blunted. Then in 1874, in the congressional elections of 1874, Democrats for the first time since the 1850s regained control of the House of Representatives. As we all know, money bills originate in the House. And Congress's financial support for carrying out both the military and the legal campaigns to sustain protection of uh, civil rights in the South were choked, not eliminated entirely. Federal prosecutors and judges scattered across the South would continue to attempt to, to protect civil rights really into the 1880s, here and there on and off. But it was a much weakened campaign because the funds weren't there. It's a lesson which one could apply to many policies, that it's, it's a, it can be dangerous to declare victory too early before the war is fully completed. And what, what occurred after that point, beginning in the mid-1870s, was the essentially the recapture of Southern governments from Republicans where they held power by white supremacists who proudly used that term. It's, that's not an anachronism. White supremacy was a battle cry. It was a proud battle cry for Southern Democrats at the time. But anyway, one after one state after another, they recaptured control of states and again further choked the power of, of the authorities where it existed to prosecute crimes against black Americans and embattled white Republicans, just such as those that remained. But so how to take stock of this whole this whole period, the Klan War, which was, as is said, was initially a great victory, but a victory whose 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 fruits were ultimately ultimately lost as whites in the South restored uh, institutions of white supremacy. On one hand, 
and grants victory is a potent reminder that forceful political action can prevail over violent extremism. It happened. It was a success. It's important to remember that. It was, that wasn't a failure. The failure was a political one that, that took place in the North. Uh, with the with the petering out of northern support for reconstruction, do you see any patterns replicated today with how the federal government is combating domestic terrorism, especially domestic terrorism that is rooted in like white supremacy? There are there are some parallels. Uh, it's it's been very interesting that aspects of the enforcement acts that we spoke about earlier, the Ku Klux Klan Act, and so on, have have reentered political and legal discourse. In recent years, especially since the the insurrection on Capitol Hill and the assault against the U.S. Capitol in, in on January sixth, and I think Americans have increasingly, or at least some Americans have increasingly grasped the reality that terrorism, right wing terrorism. Let's be clear about what we're talking about here: is real in the United States, uh, or at least the insurrectionary impulse that. Uh, organizations like the Proud Boys uh, and, and so on are insurrectionary organizations that have some analogy with the Ku Klux Klan. The, bar- the barbarism of the post-Civil War Ku Klux Klan so far is in a class by itself. I, I, I can't repeat that often enough, that, that uh, the, the extreme violence, murderousness, and, and sadism of, of the Klan of that era uh, has has not been replicated in a systematic or or large scale way, but we have to, we have to admit that the potential for for dare I say insurrectionary serious insurrectionary and ultimately terrorist activity exists today. Now, many many governors and the federal government I think are are not oblivious to this. Uh, in California, in particular, I know that. Um, that the state under Gavin Newsom uh, has maintained a very, very close watch on radical right-wing organizations. Uh, I, I mean, I know that because I, I interviewed him several times on this subject a few years ago, and he discussed it and was very, very alert to the fact that many such groups exist in California and scattered elsewhere in the United States. I think it's hard for Americans, broadly speaking, to take this seriously. Uh, it's in the nature of human beings to be complacent unless they're for, until they're forced not to be. I think it's it's imperative that the subject remain a part of, of public discourse. And, and I think, especially since we have a former president who is seems all too eager to fan the flames of, of grievance, resentment, distrust of government, even racial hatred, and so on, and thereby, given his popularity in some quarters, to empower other people in authority, including members of Congress, certainly, which we saw in the uh, around uh, the insurrection of January 6th, to empower other members of Congress or, 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 or popular figures to also uh, fan you know, a profound, bitter, irrational distrust of the federal government. I just read a few days ago in the Washington Post, I think, that uh, fewer than 20 percent, fewer than 20 percent of Americans believe that the federal government will do the right thing most of the time. That is shocking. It's shocking, that degree of of uh, distrust of the national government. I mean, something that that has been true through most of our history, and I, I've written many books on aspects of American history from the founding up through Reconstruction, is that until fairly recent times, Americans' pride in their government was extremely high, and this this contempt for government, contempt for Congress, contempt for basic Democratic and Republican institutions is a relatively recent thing in the United States and very dangerous indeed uh, because it leaves ordinary people feeling that the government isn't worth saving, it isn't worth protecting, it isn't worth respecting and makes people all the more vulnerable to the appeal of, I would say, reactionary radicals. 
like the people who stormed the Capitol. And, and so I think I, I think we need we need to be thinking a great deal about this, and and we need to face the fact that the potential for for organized violence still exists, if still mostly latent in our country. It's not alien to the United States. Is there anything you want to mention about the government's war on the Klan or President Grant's uh, fight against the Klan that I haven't asked or that hasn't been brought up yet? Let's talk for a minute about Grant himself. I mean, Grant, as most people would probably know, uh, has suffered uh, from a pretty poor reputation for most of the past century and a half. I think most Americans, if asked at all, would say, oh, he was probably one of the worst presidents. Uh, uh, wasn't he or wasn't his, his administration full of corruption? Weren't they incompetent? Uh, and in, it, it, it's true enough that at, for quite a while, Grant's presidency was ranked as one of the least effective in American history. Happily, that has changed. That assessment has changed. It's been changing dramatically. One, it has to be understood that that assessment, that that dire assessment of Grant was systematically uh, imposed by the defenders of the so-called lost cause during the Jim, long, long Jim Crow era, partly to completely erase Grant's commitment to civil rights, commitment to the empowerment of African Americans, commitment to sustaining the uh, victory of the national government in the Civil War. By belittling Grant, uh, it became possible to denigrate whatever he did accomplish. And Grant was, by and large, a relatively effective president. Uh, where was there corruption within his administration? Yeah, but not 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 to a radically unusual degree, though it was very highly publicized in some instances. Uh, was Grant incompetent? No, he wasn't incompetent at all. He was not an natural politician. He, he was not a, let's say, a Bill Clinton, a backslapping type of uh, figure. He was a shy, rather introverted man uh, who, as I said, was not a natural politician. But it's imperative to look at Grant through the lens of civil rights a lens which was not applied to him for several generations. Grant, Grant came to, civil, to, to his convictions through an evolutionary process. His father was an abolitionist, uh, which is significant. He was raised in Ohio, uh, Ulysses Grant was. Uh, his father was an abolitionist. He himself was not an abolitionist. He was essentially not very political before the Civil War. He, at one point, briefly owned one enslaved man who was bestowed upon him and his wife as a gift by his in-laws who were slave owners. It was it made him extremely uncomfortable. And as soon as he could free that individual, he did. When he could have sold the man for a thousand or more dollars in Missouri where they lived. Uh, but instead he freed him. Um, he needed money, but he would not sell a human being. During the Civil War, uh, Grant's sensitivity to the realities of, of slavery and life for Black Americans was deepened. He uh, welcomed fugitive slaves into his army's camps, uh, gave them jobs. He didn't send them back to their masters, as many federal officers did. He also welcomed uh, the recruitment of Black volunteers to the federal armies. And in the last year of the war, a, a very large number of black troops fought under his command in Virginia. Other federal officers, including his close friend, William Tecumseh Sherman, didn't want anything to do with black troops. Sherman was deeply racist. Grant was not. Uh, he certainly evolved far, far from the conventional uh, bigotry or racism of the age in which he lived. And um, after the Civil War, he, he embraced the radical cause. And I'll say again that what radicalism meant was a vigorous, forceful reconstruction policy and the empowerment of African Americans in public life. So Grant was transformed from a non-political man into a into a man deeply, deeply committed to ensuring that all Americans, including uh, Black Americans, enjoyed 
the fruits of the Civil War and would become full-fledged uh, participants in in American life. And he did his best to ensure that as long as he was president. And I think with that, we will leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. I appreciate uh, all your, your excellent questions. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website at lawfaremedia.org support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. The podcast was edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan, and as always, thank you for listening.